welcome. You have found a website for Emmanuel United Methodist Church in Bradenton, Florida, and we're so happy that you've joined us. Whether you're here intentionally or we're just Googling around, I don't know if Googling's a proper verb or not, but I like it. Anyway, you have found us and we're so glad you're with us this morning and we know you're gonna be glad that you are also. My name is Greg and I'm gonna serve as your liturgist today and a couple of announcements to let you know. Uh, first of all, this message is designed for June 7, 2020, but July 5th, the first Sunday in July is the Sunday that we are hoping that we are going to be able to get back together in person for worship. But we do have a team right now that's working on all the ins and outs of that and how we can do that safely by following not only the church conference guidelines, but the directions from the CDC and others. And we don't want it to happen. We, we, well, we'd love to have it happen tomorrow, but of course we don't want it to happen until we can all feel as safe as possible getting together. And if you have any special concerns or thoughts or comments that you'd like to make, please either email the church or call and, and leave a message. And another thing this morning, there, this will be a communion service later on. So if you would like to participate from wherever you are, now would be a great time to pause this message and go and get the elements that you will have to use during the time of communion following our message this morning from Pastor Kim. Now this morning, first of all, let's share together with the traditional Apostles' Creed. If you do have a Methodist hymnal book, you'll find that it's number 881 in that book, and you may have it memorized. So let's share together with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried. The third day he arose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Our scripture reading today comes both from the Old and the New Testament. Our Old Testament reading is from Genesis, the first chapter, the first two verses, and I'm reading from the New International Version translation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Now hear the words from the New Testament book of John. This is the first chapter, verses one through five. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Good morning. It's a privilege to be here with you this morning. Would you please join me in prayer? O oh, holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing unto you, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. We saw it in Egypt. My husband Greg and I took a cruise on the Nile after we visited Israel in February with the bishop's trip. We saw a Nubian musical group. Now, the Nubians were the original people group that inhabited much of Egypt and Sudan, and they still exist today in modern-day Egypt, and we had visited one of their communities. So one of their musical groups came to the ship to be able to uh, perform for us, and they believed in audience participation. 
multiple times they pulled many of us up out of our seats and out onto the, the stage, which was actually the dance floor, but uh, where they interacted with us. The first time that I was pulled out of my chair, it was pure comedy. The gentleman that was leading it, uh, he didn't understand any English or Chinese or Korean for some from the other people that were there. Uh, and we didn't understand any Nubian. And so it was pure comedy. He couldn't keep a straight face himself, much less us keep a straight face. The second time I stood up though, that they brought me out, it was to dance. They taught us a couple simple dance moves and then it began, the conga line. Yep, that's right, a conga line right there on the ship in Egypt. There was this joy and this happiness about it as it got going and it, it just increased as more and more people were added to the line. Almost everybody joined in. Well, except for my husband, you know him. So um, <laughs> when I think about those days though, that day, those moments, I can understand why when the early church fathers tried to come up with a way to describe the Trinity, that they chose a word called perichoresis, which actually means circle dance. I think it describes the Trinity rather well because Jesus talks repeatedly about he is in the Father and the Father is in him and he includes the Holy Spirit after that and that he is in us and we are part of him. So what a contradictory thing it is that Sometimes we struggle to find joy in our faith. Now, many people do have trouble with the concept of the Trinity. First of all, because the word Trinity doesn't appear anywhere in the Bible. But that does make sense because it's a theological word used to try to describe something that's witnessed in the Bible but isn't necessarily named. Uh, unlike salvation by faith, for example, that does say, that is right there in the scriptures. But after all, there's more to be concerned about than just that. I mean, what is this about God is one and God is three? We have one God of one substance who is three persons who are all God, fully God. We struggle with this for a reason. Simply put, it's because it's a mystery. And I don't think it's a mystery that we're meant to be able to solve. Because God is so much bigger, so much more than what we can conceive of in our humanity. Each person of the Trinity has distinct characteristics and functions, and yet they are all, each person is fully God in and of the person's self, but yet they are only one God together. It implies that the mathematical equation one plus one plus one equals one is correct. It may not be correct for math, but it is for the Trinity. And it is a true statement that seems to be self-contradictory. Thus it is a paradox. It is a paradox of the one who are three, the one who is three, and the three who are one. Now in these first verses of Genesis, we see God who is creating and God's spirit, but the son of God we don't notice. There are some writers who say that when God says, let there be light, that that is the revealing of the son, not the creating of the son. While others say no, that God is creating, it's from when God began to create, so therefore that is not where the son is located. To get an idea, though, of where we do see the sun, how we see the sun there, we have to look at other texts. One of them is the second text that Greg Lynch read today, John 1, 1 through 5, which begins, in the beginning was the word. In the beginning was the word. The word is, and Jesus are one. And it goes on to say that God that through him all things were made. God spoke creation into being through the word who is the Son. And if we need to have it said more plainly, we can go to Hebrews 
1, 1 and 2, where it says, In the past God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. As pastor and writer Brian McLaren shares about the Trinity, he says the Trinity is an eternal dance, going back to that idea of the circle dance, of Father, Son, and Spirit, sharing mutual love and honor, happiness, joy, and respect. Against this backdrop, God's act of creation means that God is inviting more and more beings into this eternal dance of joy. Sin means that people step away from the dance, and it corrupts the beauty and the rhythm, crashing and tackling and stepping on feet instead of moving in, with grace and rhythm and reverence. Then in Jesus, God enters creation to restore the rhythm and beauty again, what a lovely vision that gives us of the dance of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And a, a metaphor that we can use to understand their relationship and also how it so eloquently envisions what it's like when we join the dance. The Trinity is a paradox, to be sure. Adding others to the dance results in a new dance where even more people join in the better it becomes then, somewhat like that conga line in Egypt. The conga wasn't really amazing until more people and more people get involved. In fact, it's even best when everyone is. When God expanded the mission, we talked about this last week, when God expanded the mission from the people of God being Israel, the people of Israel, to say that now that all people would be invited into the body of Christ, all people, regardless of whether they were born to, in Israel or born as a Jew or not, it opened up new and unfamiliar possibilities that many just didn't know what to do with. Like the Trinity, the dance to which God invites us all is intended to be an experience of love and honor, happiness, joy, and respect. The paradox is that all the good that can be experienced in God Yet we often choose not to live into the equality among all of us that the Trinity invites us to. As we have seen in recent weeks, one of the lesser things some choose result in racism. And it's not something we've only seen in recent weeks. It's just come to the fore. The intentional demeaning or oppression of others because of some quality, these days because of being people of color. Most recently in the news, the death of George Floyd. For him, the impact went far beyond being demeaned to, as we can see on the video, the apparent in intentional taking of his life. I know that as a white person, I find it difficult to talk about racism because I get paralyzed by two things. The desire not to hurt those of color because I speak not out of their experience. I speak in ignorance about what they experience. And also, frankly, the desire not to offend those who aren't people of color but the thing is, Jesus wasn't so worried about whether he was offensive or not. He worried about whether what he said was true. And friends, what I can tell you that is true is the time is over for us to stop talking about this. Knowing what the scriptures, including the gospels, say about injustice and oppression, I can no longer, in good conscience, remain silent, even if I do stumble in my efforts, even if we, as a church, stumble in our efforts. It's only when we, including myself, humbly step into these admittedly difficult conversations that we can begin to 
help dismantle the bias that is a daily fact of life for people of color, which people who are white do not see because it is not applied to them. We are all equally created in the image of God. How many more times how many more times must we watch such violence on social media and on the TV before we will say it's enough? How much longer must those who live in fear every day of their lives, how much longer must they wait before the people who can make a difference will make a difference, will act to join them? How long must they wait before those who are white will join them to find justice. Speaking out, speaking out for all those whom God values, which we've just shown God values each and every person regardless of their characteristics. They've all been invited to the dance. Friends, it will not be comfortable nor will it be easy to have honest conversations about our feelings, about our fears, about our beliefs, about people of color, or the way that those of us who are white have benefited from institutional and interpersonal bias on the part of others. For those ways are largely invisible to us, comfortable or not, Still, we must try. Easy or not, we cannot wait. Scripture makes it clear over and over that we are to side with the oppressed. In Psalm 72, 14, it says that he, meaning God, will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. And in Luke 4, 18 to 19, we hear Jesus himself say, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. God stands on the side of the oppressed. When we choose not to do so, we become the ones who have purposefully stepped out of the dance begun by the Trinity, corrupting its beauty and its rhythm. As your pastor, I also cannot in good conscience continue not to act in some way that will help my brothers and sisters of color, of whom some are a part of my family. Now I want you to understand, though, that I do not in any way agree with those who have chosen to loot and destroy as an expression of their anger or an expression of their desire for things to be different. I support those who protest in peace and I hope that law enforcement will allow them to continue to do that in peace. But for those who are looters and others, while it may be in their minds and hearts a valid expression of the emotions of what they are feeling, it does not yet still make it right. And for those who think that this is simply political, I believe that I've already shown that it comes straight out of the gospel. Our God has asked us to care for each other in ways that go beyond what the average care might be, that goes beyond what might be comfortable for us, that instead asks us to work for justice in every situation. And as United Methodists, two of our three basic tenets of our faith that are summarized by, as summarized by John Wesley are do good and do no harm. I think these both apply in this situation. In the article, the threat of blackness, which was on our uh, Florida Annual Conference website this week, flumc.org, if you'd like to go out to see it, as in Florida United Methodist Church. 
four United, Medi United Methodist black pastors tell their stories. One of them, Reverend Dr. Kevin James, shared how in 2002, uh, police were looking for four black males who were in an SUV who had committed a crime. Now, Reverend James had just picked up a black male friend who was joining he, both he, his wife, and his nine, uh, oh, excuse me, his fourth grade son to go to a football game. Shortly after he picked up his friend, he was pulled over by the police and very shortly after that, no less than 14 additional police cars arrived, all with guns drawn, aiming at his family and friend. The two men were handcuffed and placed face down on the ground while they frisked the, um, Dr. James' wife and son, and they searched the car for a gun that was committed, used in the commission of the crime. He said that when the department corporal determined that he was actually Reverend James, the district superintendent of the then St. Petersburg district of the United Methodist Church, they released them without comment or apology. It was a painful and humiliating experience that still haunts this family. They did not resist. They were not unwilling to cooperate while understanding the need for police to do their duty, which they must be able to do. This was not a situation that we likely would have seen had his color been different. Reverend James still prays daily for his now grown son that he will make it home safe at night. Friends, our Trinitarian God in whom we believe is unequivocal about the need to care for those who struggle in injustice and oppression, regardless of their race or any other characteristic for that matter. All are invited to the circle dance begun in the Trinity, the perichoresis that begins in God. It's been time for a long time for our silence to end for the difficult discussions to occur, and for the church to live into the promise of the Holy Spirit in our midst. In the words of Bishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa, if you are neutral in situations of justice, you have chosen the side of the oppressor. This does not mean that we all must go out and protest, for we would follow where God leads each one of us by the Holy Spirit. But it does mean that there needs to be action, though it must first be informed. We must first learn from each other and from people of color. Two ways I would like to see this church act is first, I would like you to join a study group to engage in open conversation about racism, what it is, what it means, how it harms everyone, not only those who experience the bias, and how we all have responsibility to each other. And I will have more details in the next week or two. We're still looking at curriculum. And then the other that I would like you to do is to attend an information session for a new ecumenical justice ministry that's forming here in Bradenton. It will be held electronically, so there won't be any need to gather in person and more information will be available next week as I get the dates. It's under a ministry, a greater ministry called DART, and DART has mission or ministries across this area. St. Petersburg has one, Tampa does, so does Sarasota. I experienced the one in Tampa when I served there, and friends, it is a breathtakingly beautiful way to be able to reach across racial boundaries, across religious boundaries, across whatever boundaries you want to, to, to put up, to be able to work together for the common good and justice of the people of our area. Our God began a dance in the Trinity. And our God extended that dance to us. 
So let's continue to dance as we find ways to faithfully work together and walk with our neighbors of color in not only these challenging days, but well into the future. In the name of Jesus, amen. Will you join me in prayer? Oh, holy God, as we thank you for this opportunity to be able to find ways to work together with our brothers and sisters of color to remove the biases that we have come to see more starkly in these days. We ask, Lord, that you would remove our fear, remove the fear of the unknown, of the different, of the this isn't what I usually do, and instead place in us curiosity, the desire to know and understand another as they come to know and understand us the desire to know ourselves better and to find those places in ourselves where sadly we don't act the way that we think. And for us most of all to draw more closely to you, to follow you closely, to follow in the Holy Spirit, to live in ways that do good and do no harm. In the name of Jesus, amen. I will move to the Holy Communion table now at this point, and we will begin shortly. The Holy Communion liturgy is a little bit different than what we usually use, but it's meant for the time after Pentecost. And since Pentecost was last week and uh, Trinity Sunday is today, I thought this might be one that was appropriate for us. The responses are the same. Where you know the responses, please respond. If you do not, I will say them. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remains steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through your prophets, who looked for that day when justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream, when nation shall not lift up sword against nation, and neither shall they learn war anymore. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. At his ascension, you exalted him to sit and reign with you at your right hand. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread. He gave thanks to you. 
he broke the bread and gave it to the disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered virtually and not, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Now, as children of God, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Because there is one body, we who partake of this loaf are one. And we who take this cup are one together. Now you may take the elements. They are not actually Holy Communion because we are not together. Theologically, we believe we must be together to be able to receive them. And yet, the Holy Spirit is at work and will work where the Holy Spirit works. And so, I will leave that to you as to your own understanding. Take the body and the blood of Christ. It was given for you. Please pray with me. Oh God, we thank you for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Let us go forth from here in the strength of your spirit to live a life that reflects the life that you modeled to us, the one that you showed us, the way that you gave us to live. Be with us in all that we do. In the name of Jesus, amen. And now as we end this service, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>